The Super Mario series has had boss fights ever since the very beginning. Bowser is the main villain of the series, but several other characters have gotten boss fights over the years in both 2D and 3D. Boss fights are generally seen as highlight moments in games, so getting them right is always important no matter what series it may be in. With how many bosses the Mario series has had, it was inevitable that some would be better than others. As the years have gone on, the developers behind the series have gotten better and better at making them, to the point where the current most recent title, Mario Odyssey, has some of the best bosses in the entire series. Even still, among these great bosses, one sticks out above the rest. Welcome to the fifth episode of Level by Level, a series where I analyze levels and games to find out what works and what doesn't. We have a very special episode today. While we are looking at Mario Odyssey once again, we aren't going to be reviewing an entire kingdom. This episode will be purely focused on the Robo Brood boss fight and what leads up to it. I should say, of course, that this is only my opinion that it's the best boss in the series, though I'll be attempting to show why I think that is in this episode. Let's lay out the structure for this video since it will be different from the other kingdom-centric episodes. First, we'll discuss what a good boss is and how it should be set up, then we'll look at the Robo Brood specific mechanics, and then we'll end with what I think sets this boss apart from any other boss fight in the series. So with all that said, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoy, I'll be ranking all of Mario Odyssey's moons at 100k, and let's jump right into why I believe the Robo Brood is such an incredible boss fight. So, what makes a good boss? Well, this is of course going to be different for everyone, but I've come up with a good set of guidelines that I think will help us determine what that is. First off, a boss should of course be challenging. The whole point of a boss fight is to basically be a test for the player. It should force them to use the skills they've learned in order to come out on top. If the test is too easy, then the boss won't be very memorable and will feel more like a minor annoyance than a fun challenge. Take the final boss fight of New Super Mario Bros. DS as an example. I'd say that this is probably the weakest Bowser fight in the series, aside from the very first Bowser fights in the NES Super Mario Bros. The reason I'm more harsh on this one is because it's newer, but the goal is essentially the same. Get behind Bowser and touch the axe. Oh, sorry, this boss is actually way different. See, it's a button this time and not an axe. Silly me. But the point is, this is just far too boring because it was way too easy. I distinctly remember beating this guy on my first try, even though the rest of the level gave me some trouble when I was younger. On the other side though, a boss shouldn't be too hard either. Okay, well let me rephrase, a required boss probably shouldn't be. I have no real problem with an extra boss being significantly more difficult, but if a boss required to beat the game is harder than every Kaizo level in Mario Maker, most people are going to rage quit and likely never attempt to pick up the game again. A perfect boss will find that very difficult balance of being a worthy opponent that's not annoyingly tedious to fight against. There's no real example of a boss that's too hard in the Mario series, but I just thought I should point that out. Another important aspect of a good boss is its uniqueness. Again, making fun of the new Super Mario Bros. Bowser, not only is it conceptually the same as the very first Bowser fight in the series, it's just two boss fights we already fought in that very game. In fact, we fight Bowser Jr. several times before even getting to the final castle, which is another reason why this is far worse than the other Bowser fights in the series. But if we want an example of a memorable Bowser fight, we have new Super Mario Bros. Wii, which in my opinion has the best 2D Bowser fight. We enter the room and- oh, wait, it's the exact same as the last one. Well, I guess all we have to do is hit the switch and nope, Bowser then grows super big and you have an incredibly intense chase sequence where you have to avoid Bowser's fire as you try to hit the true switch to save the real Princess Peach. This was like the first plot twist I ever experienced as a kid, especially after coming off of the new Super Mario Bros. DS disappointing ending. But that just goes to show how much more of an impact a unique, challenging boss leaves than a basic easy one. Uniqueness doesn't just come from mechanics either, as being visually distinct is also quite important as well. The Mario series generally does a phenomenal job on its boss design, though Mario 64's Wiggler is probably one of the weaker examples. I always forget this guy is even in the game, he's just kind of a big Wiggler. I mean, the same can go for the Womp King, but at least he's in one of the game's best levels. And to be honest, the Wiggler's mechanics aren't that great either. Even then, there's a reason King bob is stuck around, showing up in several spin-offs, and these guys really haven't. So making a boss have a strong presence in both its mechanics and design is very important. The final main element I want to talk about before we get into the Robo Brood itself is making sure the boss isn't confusing. If there's one thing that's more frustrating than not being able to beat a boss, it's not knowing how. It's okay for the boss to take a little thinking of course, but the main challenge should really come from execution rather than figuring out what to do. As an example, I just beat Link's Awakening HD recently. I know, I played a game without Mario in it, crazy. Though it still has Goombas in it, so don't worry, I'm not going that far out of my comfort zone. Anyways, the final boss was incredibly annoying for me, specifically this phase right here. Now, some enemies in the game can't be damaged by certain moves, which is fair enough as most of them are pretty obvious. This guy though didn't take damage from my sword, magic rod, arrows, or anything else I threw at him. I went through two of my three fairies, frustratingly trying all of my items with no luck. 
at this point, I just got annoyed and didn't want to restart, so I looked up how to beat him, and get this, the only way you can hit him is specifically with the spin attack. There is absolutely nothing here to help you come to that conclusion. What, am I supposed to guess that since he spins his weapon, I'm supposed to use the spin attack? There are plenty of enemies that use swords that can't be killed by them. And also, you can damage him with the charge attack for some reason? Like, there's zero way to be able to guess that one. So that's one example of how not to do a boss. However, most of the Mario series has done a variety of different things to let the player know how to defeat each of their bosses. For example, many of Mario 64's bosses use dialogue to clue the player into how to defeat them. It's not the most elegant way to do things, but it gets the job done. It's not very immersive or seamless though, as the bosses just sit there and tell you the controls. But what's a better way of doing this? Well, for that, I think it's about time we look at the main boss fight of this video, the Robo Brood. The Mecha Brutal, oh, uh, the boss's official name is the Robo Brood, but I also like calling it the Mecha Brutal. Anyways, the Robo Brood is the final boss fight in Bowser's Kingdom, the penultimate boss fight before your showdown against Bowser himself. This combines all four of the main Brutals together for one last showdown against them all. It's made immediately clear for the player that you'll need to defeat these four in order to beat the boss. That means the next question for a player to ask would be, how would they actually get up to the Brutals? The way the mech is designed, the Brutals are just far out of reach for Mario to simply jump up to them, which may I add is a great way to incorporate design into gameplay. Play. Anyway, to answer that question, we're going to need to look at the context of the entirety of Bowser's Kingdom up until this point. Some of you may think that the design of a boss fight begins and ends with the fight itself. However, that is far from the case as this whole level acts as build up for that very boss. There are three story moons in this kingdom before the player reaches the Robo Brood. Infiltrate Bowser's Castle is the first moon, which allows you to get a sense of the kingdom, but more importantly, it introduces you to the kingdom's main capture, the Pokios. These guys are able to stick their beaks into wooden objects and certain walls, allowing themselves to be propelled in any direction the player wishes by simply flicking them there. The capture mechanic has been in the game ever since the start, so the player has already been primed to try and capture new things. While they aren't required to at this moment, this gives us a relatively safe space to be introduced to them. Afterwards, we have the second moon, Smart Bombing. This to me serves two main purposes. One is to expand on the Pokios I talked about before. Here we get an area that we can run around with these guys and use their special abilities to their fullest potential. If you didn't know that these beaks could attack or collect things for you, you do now. The second primary purpose of this moon is to introduce the bomb obstacle. It's pretty obvious by its design that you probably don't want to get hit by it, but that's not just its only purpose. One of the five moon shards are located inside a metal box, which you can't destroy by just using the Pokios beak. Okay, well you can, but it takes like 50 pokes and that's only really helpful for coinless runs. Oh my God! Anyways, the main way you're supposed to destroy these is with those bombs. By doing some experimentation, you'll see that poking at them will cause them to shoot in the direction you hit them in. This gives the player the idea to destroy the metal box with them, which is successful, allowing them to move on to the third moon. Big Brutal Battle reminds us of, well, the Brutals, in this case Topper and Harriet, who are both fought before in the Cap and Sand Kingdoms respectively. This way, players know that they're a target, just in case they forgore. After that, there's one final stretch to the boss, which gives us a little bit more time to work with the Pokios. That way, you'll be guaranteed to be familiar with them before for the boss. Okay, well technically you can skip them, but no one is doing this on their first playthrough. This section is also very focused on climbing, also showcasing that metallic surfaces cannot be attached to. And finally, that brings us back to the Robo Brood itself. How did all of that build up help perfectly show the player how to defeat it without needing to say a single word? Well, as I said before, the Brutals are the obvious weak point. The cutscene before the fight pointing them out does a great job at making it pretty obvious who you have to hit. But that brings us back to the question we had before the last segment. How do we get up to them? Well, that's where the Robo Brood's attacks finally come in. On the first phase of the fight, the robot will be stationary and shoot bombs towards the player. They already know that these things will pack a punch, so they try and avoid them while trying to think of a good way to win this fight. It's not too long though until the Robo Brood spits out not a bomb, but a Pokio. And this is where all of that buildup from those three moons come into play. Mario now has a tool to get up to the Brutals, but as he learned in the lead up, he can't climb anything metallic. That's where Moon 2 comes into play, as the realization hits you that the bombs can either damage the boss or even destroy the metal around its legs like the metal crate from earlier. Upon testing it out, the player is proven to be 100% correct with the legs cracking after the explosion. After two hits, the legs coating breaks off and becomes wood, showcasing that the player can now finally climb up and poke whichever Brutal they have access to. This is the general structure for the entire boss fight, and it didn't require the Brutals to directly tell the player how to defeat them. The build up to the fight through the moons and the long climb up does everything a speech could have done in a significantly more engaging way. It makes this fight much more satisfying to do. If you were just told, we're gonna spit out a Pokio at you, please don't hit our legs with our bombs, then it'd be much less immersive or fun to figure out. Even still, there is a little bit of hidden dialogue inside this boss fight. This time though, it doesn't come from the boss, it actually comes from Cappy. If you take too long to hit the Brutal's legs, then Cappy will chime in with what you're supposed to do, which I think is a much better way of doing things. It comes in after a while, so only players that are truly lost would ever see it. 
That way nobody is confused, but it doesn't really take away from the immersion at all. It's understandable why the Mario 64 bosses had to give speeches, as there isn't really much building up to them like there is here. Sure, you could say that the Babams of Babam Battlefield act as build up for King Babam, since they both need to be picked up to be defeated, but there's the problem with the player just ignoring every bomb they see to get to the summit. Bowser Kingdom's linear layout, while somewhat hurting the post-game exploration, makes it perfect for setting up this final challenge. Speaking of challenge, buildup is of course not the only important thing, and this absolutely delivers in being a challenging boss fight. I'd go as far as to say that this is the hardest boss in the game. I don't think it's quite the hardest in the series, that probably still goes to the final Bowser in Mario 64, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't die quite a few times here. We already went over the pretty standard first phase. That one isn't really meant to hurt you, rather make sure that you can understand what you're doing before it gets into the real fight. After defeating the first Brutal, the Robo Brutal will attempt to step on you, which would of course deal damage. It moves pretty quick as well, not to mention you'll be moving slowly if you decide to keep the Pokio around. Once it's done, it will continue like the previous phase. Phase 3 is by far the most unique. The robot receives rainbow legs and begins charging at the player. Afterwards, it will surround itself with a ring of rings. These each move incredibly unpredictably and are easy to get hit by if you aren't careful. The mech will once again attempt to step on you before you get another chance to attack. It's important to mention that if you mess up your turn by, say, missing a bomb, the mech or brutal will go back into its ring phase, so you definitely want to get rid of the boss as soon as possible. After defeating the third brutal, the fourth phase is pretty much the same as the last one, though this time it won't get the rainbow legs and will instead spend a longer time trying to stomp the player. With just how many different attacks this guy has, it makes it pretty easy to get hit. Even with the hearts around the arena, there's a good chance this boss might take you a few tries. It's not too frustrating though either, as it's very clear what you have to do to win the fight, and executing it feels super satisfying. This is probably the most intense and longest fight in the game, unless you aren't good at one-cycling the Mega Wiggler, and in that case, I'm so sorry. The length isn't a detriment though, just like its difficulty, this fight is paced perfectly. Unlike most bosses in the Mario series, Series, this thing takes four big hits to defeat as opposed to three. While that does extend the length of the fight, it still makes it feel like you're making progress throughout it. That's why I believe this is one of the most intense fights in the series, but what about iconicity and uniqueness? Well, I think it's safe to say, this Robobrew nails its aesthetic design as well. Not only does this thing have a strong presence with its tall height and intimidating Madame Brood face, but its design fits the boss fight as well. It's tall so that the player can't just jump up to the Brutals, the legs are metallic so that the bombs are required to hit it, the main design is wooden to show that the Pokio can stick onto it, and so on. Not only is the boss practical, but aesthetically, it's also perfect. Let's look back at when we first meet this thing. It looks like it's about to be the final showdown between Mario and Bowser, however it's revealed that Bowser is actually leaving to have his wedding on the moon, meaning that there's still more adventure to await. Mario doesn't want that to happen though, so he tries to beat up Bowser, and, well, it doesn't go his way. That's when we get the entrance of the Mecha Brutal, the giant thing shaking the screen as it shows each of the Brutals Mario and Cappy have faced. All of this while the boss's theme starts to pick up, and man, it's incredible. You know what, here, I'm just gonna play the opening right now. Mario Odyssey has one of my absolute favorite soundtracks, and this is one of my absolute favorite songs in it. It just gets you absolutely pumped for this boss fight. Really, only the Ruined Dragon has a boss theme that can even compete with it, in my opinion. The way the beat lines up to the reveal of each Brutal before picking up a Mario and Cappy can begin moving is perfect. On top of that, this is one of the nicest looking arenas as well. The incredibly colorful background clouds and the fireworks really help give this fight its own unique feel from the other bosses in the series. Speaking of fireworks, I love how the mech turns into fireworks themed after the Brutals after it's defeated. It gives the ending some more flair and a sense of finality for the Brutals since it's the last time you'll see these four before the main boss. So I think it's pretty safe to say, the Robo Brood also nails it in the aesthetics department. And that covers all of the core elements to making a good boss fight I mentioned before, and it's clear to see that the Mecha Brutal excels in every single category. All of this would easily place it within my top 10 bosses of all time. However, that's not quite a clear number one spot. See, what I haven't mentioned up until now is that many of the boss fights in Odyssey follow this level of buildup, difficulty, and even design. Heck, the Ruined Dragon is quite close to the Robo Brood in all of these fields I mentioned so far. Since you need to pull out a sword to reach this guy in the first place, it's obvious that you need to pull out the swords on the dragon's head. While this guy isn't quite as hard as the Robo Brood, he's not far off, and it definitely wins design-wise. I mean, just look at how intimidating and different it is from every other Mario boss. So, despite many of Odyssey's bosses excelling alongside the Robo Brood, why 
do I still think it surpasses all of them? Well, so far I've only really been talking about a first playthrough of the game, but many people don't just play games once. Replayability is the secret factor for a great boss fight that I haven't mentioned yet, and this right here is where the Mecha Brutal breaks far past the rest of the series' best boss fights. So I'm sure you all are wondering, how do you make a boss replayable? Well, first you have to of course nail the other aspects we talked about before, however you also need to make sure the boss isn't tedious to defeat. A tedious fight can basically be described as one that isn't fun due to a combination of it being generally easy or just too long. Now that does bring up an immediate dilemma, long boss fights can be a lot of fun on a first playthrough as they give off the feeling of an intense battle, but on repeat playthroughs, that same length can lead to the boss being unfun. On the other hand, if a boss is too short, then it won't really leave an impression in either playthrough, so what's the solution here? Well, Mario Odyssey answers this predicament in what I think is the perfect method, by adding in secret ways to speed up each of the bosses in the game. Now I don't mean this makes the boss literally faster, what I mean is that almost every boss in the game has secret things you can do to make the downtime go by a little quicker. Let's Let's take Topper for example as his skips are the easiest to point out. So normally when you fight him you need to knock off all of his hats and then jump on him. Afterwards you'll hide in one of his hats and you'll need to dodge them all as they bounce around the arena. Once he gets up you'll need to repeat the process while avoiding his attack when he spins on the floor. That'll be your standard first run through of this boss which is pretty solid. On repeat playthroughs though it could have been a bit tedious due to how much waiting is involved so Nintendo added two skips that you can do here if you're skilled enough. For one, you can jump in the hat he's hiding in to instantly make him get up again. You can also skip knocking off all of his hats, as when he spins on the floor, you can actually just jump on him right there. Both of these speed up the fight, however they aren't exactly easy to pull off. Going for these tricks make the fight more difficult, adding in a very satisfying risk and reward system that makes repeated run-throughs more interesting. All of the Brutals have skips like this and many of the other bosses do as well. It's one of the main reasons why Odyssey is such a fun game to speedrun as it gives you so much control as to how fast the boss fights can go. But I'm sure you all have guessed by now, the Robo Brutal skips are by far the most interesting of any boss in the entire series. Let's start off with the basic way to speed this up first. So after the first phase, the Mecha Brutal will normally knock you off. However, with enough skill, you're able to Cappy Bounce back on top of the Robo Brood. It'll attempt to knock you off one more time, but from there, you're free to hit any of the Brutals while the mech is still standing. Now, staying on the mech and hitting these guys is definitely not an easy thing to do. With how much it moves around, it's very easy to just completely miss the Brutals and land back onto the ground for almost insured damage. On top of that, if you try going for this, you won't be able to keep your Pokio, meaning you'll have to go towards the mech to get a new one, leading to some possibly more damage. Not to worry though, as the devs actually included another skip for a situation situation like this. See, when you start the fight, the Robo Brood will have metal balls on the side of its legs. However, after the first phase, these will actually retract to reveal three wooden circles. If you're skilled enough with the Pokio, you'll be able to climb back up the legs to reach the top without using any bombs. It's sort of hard to explain without doing it yourself, but this boss is easily one of the most fun parts of the game to replay. Trying to lower your personal time on this fight alone is a surprisingly fun thing to do as there's just so much room to improve everything. This is the most movement-heavy boss in the game and that's exactly what Odyssey excels at. Finding the best order and times to hit the Brutals without falling off keeps me looking forward to this fight. It also makes it one of the most intense portions of the speedrun as there's so much risk but so much reward right at the very end of the game. This is one of the very few bosses in the Mario series that I can say maintains its intensity level every single time you play it. Oh, and that's not even every skip on this guy. Remember how I said you can't jump up to the Brutals? Well, I may have been lying as the legs are structured in just the right way to allow Mario to completely ignore the Pokio entirely. I finally learned how to do this for this video and I had such a blast doing it. I'm not even kidding, I was here for an hour or two just getting footage and practicing this method a lot. Since the only way to hit the Brutals without the Pokio was with ground pounding, spin pounds are used throughout the entire fight, making this an even more impressive feat. So my reason for thinking this is the Mario series' best boss is because it's by far the most fun to come back to. The way this allows for the player to consistently improve their time through practice is amazing to me. It strikes that absolutely perfect balance of difficulty and fun which puts this far, far ahead of any other boss in the series. But anyways, that's it for this video. I hope now you all understand why I decided to make this video only on the Robo Brood instead of the Kingdom as a whole. There really was just that much to talk about here. Oh, and if it wasn't obvious, this guy makes the S tier on my level by level tier list. I mean, it's an uncontested first place right now. If you all have any suggestions for future level by levels, let me know in the comments. Next episode will probably be something other than Odyssey, so feel free to suggest any game you want to. If you want to be notified when that next episode comes out, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel as it really helps me out a ton. But anyways, dry bones for Smash, and I'll see you guys next time.